Daniel chapter 3. And when you find that, please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Daniel chapter 3. And we begin reading verse 14. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 14. And the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And tonight's message is, Will you stand when others bow? Will you stand when others bow as we continue in our series through the book of Daniel? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for this wonderful story of of your um, power, your hand. And and for those that uh, uh, stood, uh, took a stand when others were bowing, uh, when others were committing idolatry, when others were um, um, going the wrong way, doing the wrong thing. Uh, Thank you for those who took a stand. And Lord, may we be encouraged, challenged, helped by the message tonight. May the message be what you want it to be. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel revealed uh, the king's dream because of what God had done. Uh, God revealed the dream to Daniel and the interpretation. And that uh, we, we covered last week about the, uh, the kingdoms the, and the, the statue representing the kingdoms and and uh, what all of that uh, is um, uh, regarding. And at that time, the, the king was pleased. He elevated Daniel. Daniel requested uh, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego also uh, have higher positions as well. And so that is then what leads into uh, chapter 3. We don't, uh, not, I don't particularly know, and I don't know that anybody knows 100% sure how, how much time elapsed between chapter 2 and chapter 3, but it, we see a shift here. Um, now, we do see that what is continuing here is the subject of an image, of a statue. And I think, um, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was pleased to have the interpretation of the dream, but he eventually let that go to his head, and Babylon was a, a very high and mighty kingdom, um, very powerful kingdom, and uh, And so, I mean, it was the pinnacle of kingdoms there at that time. And so Nebuchadnezzar, verse 1, the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together under the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud to you, it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now this was, first and foremost, we see Nebuchadnezzar's pride. His pride. He lets things go to his head. He's... he's now, notice that the entire image, compared to uh, what was in chapter 2 in his dream, this entire image is made of gold, and it was something that represented the gold on the image, the gold head, uh, the image of chapter 2 in his dream, 
represented his kingdom. It was the kingdom of Babylon. And so, boy, what a, what a great thing to be right at the top, to be made of gold, not to be made of anything uh, of, of baser value, but to, to be golden. We're the golden kingdom. We're the best one. We're the most valuable. We're the most precious high kingdom. And, of course, Nebuchadnezzar being at the height of it, being the king, uh, lets that go to his head. And so he went from glorifying the God of Daniel in chapter 2 to exalting himself in chapter 3. Because notice in chapter 2 and verse 47, look back at that, the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. And that's what we see uh, with a, I guess, uh, a king that, he shifted from one extreme to the other on uh, more than one occasion. And so there he's, oh, yes, your God is a God of gods. Wow, he's going he's gonna to give glory to the God of Daniel, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But then he turns in, around and, oh, here's now an image that everybody needs to bow to. A golden image, it represents him, it represents his kingdom. Now, the, the uh, standard 18-inch cubit, Hebrew cubit was used. Cubits varied in size throughout uh, history, but uh, in general, it's, it's widely uh, regarded as being 18 inches in, in, in general. So if it was 18 inches, uh, the statue would have been 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, which proportionally doesn't really make a lot of sense, but some would say that there may have been a pedestal that the, the statue was on, which might have affected the dimensions of it. But either way, that's what we have if you use the 18-inch Hebrew cubit, um, 90 feet high. That's, a, that's pretty high. That's, actually, that's really high. <laughs> that's really high. And um, so this is a very magnificent statue. It's, it's meant to have a place of prominence, whether it was on a, a pedestal or whether it was just this, I mean, from the feet on the ground up to the, up, uh, up 90 feet. I mean, that, that is an impressive statue. And it was an impressive kingdom. So Nebuchadnezzar, they, they wanted that to, they wanted a statue that reflected the glory and majesty of the kingdom. And... So they set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So it's a place where m many people can gather, an open area. And it says in verse 4, uh, people, nations, and languages. So this was a variety of, so people would be the general group of people. Nations is people groups. And uh, the languages represents, of course, the different languages. Now we think of nations as political boundaries oftentimes, but actually in the Bible and even today in other countries, uh, and, and somewhat in America, but the word nation actually means, has to do more with groups of people rather than actual political boundaries. And so I, I read a book at one time, uh, it's not a Christian-based book, not from a Christian author, but it was a very interesting, I thought, informative book. Um, until it got to the end, he kind of was weird right at the end. His, his premise there at the end, was I didn't really care for it. But overall, it was a very informative, interesting book. and it was called, It's called American Nations. And what he, his whole point was is that America, even though, of course, we think of America as a nation and its political boundaries, America was settled by different nations, so to speak, as far as groups of people coming from different places. That, that's really the, the, the overall uh, more common meaning of the word nations. And so you have different people groups coming together, different languages. And, uh, and so there's this command here uh, that when you hear this, the sound of the music, and there's wind instruments, there's stringed instruments, and it says all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image. Now I find it interesting that here for this idolatrous statue, this idol that's set up for people to bow down and, and worship, that music was the signal for worship. Music was the signal for worship. Which tells me, you know, this wasn't just in a Christian church. <laughs> this, was, this was something completely pagan, an idolatrous nation. And it shows the music's important role in worship. And, and I say that, number one, that music is important in regard to worship. And then the type of music we have is also important in worship. And that's not the point of the message tonight, not delving into that, but just notice that there was a connection between music 
and worship even here in this idolatrous country. And so what the, what the and then we don't necessarily know what, uh, what song was being played, you know, all hail King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, Babylon, sweet Babylon, or whatever songs they might have had. Um, but uh, come now, let us worship the king, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, whatever it might have been. But music is connected with worship, and uh, it is important. It's, it's not a secondary issue. It's a primary issue that the type of music we use in, uh, that, is, that we're worshiping the right thing, worshiping the right person. And when you have music that is emotion-centered, that's used in worship services, it's not really worshiping God. It's worshiping one's flesh and indulging the emotions and the, uh, and, and the feelings of the flesh. And so very, very important in that. And much of uh, the contemporary uh, music and the contemporary worship is something that proclaims to be worshiping God or preparing people's hearts to be worshiping God, but it is actually uh, fleshly and it, it elevates the people. It does not elevate the Lord. Um, <clears throat> so Nebuchadnezzar's pride we see here in the first uh, portion of this chapter. But then in verse 8, now it says in verse 7 that all, that, 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 that the people fell down and worshipped. It said all the people, the nations. But then in verse 8, we see that there's an exception. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now, I don't have, I mean, it, it does not state their motivation here. But I just wonder from chapter 2, of course, I don't know how many years passed from chapter 2 to chapter 3 as far as the time frame. But I, I do find it interesting that it's the Chaldeans who accused them, and it was the Chaldeans who were made to look bad in chapter 2. They were made to look bad in front of the king in chapter 2. And, and they also say there are certain Jews, so they're targeting these particular Jews, maybe not all the Jews, but they were targeting these particular Jews. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs. Look, there's some high up Jews here that you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, and they have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now, it's possible that Nebuchadnezzar didn't put two and two together when uh, Daniel requested that they have higher positions, uh, that it wouldn't be a surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise that they would not regard his God, his statue, but they would only serve um, serve their one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they did not regard or serve his gods. That shouldn't have been a surprise, but uh, especially wouldn't be a surprise with Daniel because he knew that he knew Daniel served a particular God, and he gave credit to him at the end of chapter 2. And... Um, but they are, so their accusation, now we don't know even exactly where Daniel was during all of this. Uh, we have, there's a couple of ideas. One is uh, he could have been out somewhere else on some other business at this time. Uh, the other, uh, another uh, possibility is that the Chaldeans were kind of starting with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then they were going to work their way up. They weren't going to just get Daniel, but they uh, would get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego first and then go to Daniel. We don't necessarily know that. Um, the Bible doesn't say, but we do see their accusations, and we do see the source uh, of the accusation and who the recipients of the accusation was, and it apparently was not a false accusation, but it was they were, they, they were the ones who were trying to, we can see they tried to get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in trouble. Now, there's a difference between knowing that someone is not following what the orders are and then actually actively trying to get them in trouble. 
you know, the Chaldeans could have sat there and said, oh boy, they're not doing that. Boy, they're going to get in trouble if they don't watch out. Somebody notices. No, they actively went to the king. And um, that there's a big difference there as well. Just trying to get somebody in trouble. We, uh, you know, we deal with that sometimes with children. And um, there's a difference when a child is disobeying and another child notices like, oh, yeah, they shouldn't be doing that. Or they might even say, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. And then there's another, it's all another matter than when you can tell a child's trying to get another child in trouble. That's uh, not, not the best way to go about it. Um, even if, I mean, the, the best thing you can do, each child can do, is just know that you're doing right, but not turning into a tattletale. But that's what these Chaldeans were doing. They were turning into a tattletale. And, of course, my, my wife and I, we've said to our children, of course, if someone's doing something very dangerous, some, if they're diso, diso, disobeying and it's very dangerous, then we, we do want to know about it uh, for their own safety. But we try to be vigilant enough. We don't want to pit our children against each other of, of tattling and going back and forth, and it turns into a competition of who can, who can get the other one in the most trouble. We don't want, necessarily want to set that tone, even though we do at times. We need to know what's going on, but... Uh, we recognize we're not going to know always everything that's going on. We're just trusting God's going to show us what we need to see. And uh, now if there's something that's, like I said, very, very serious, we are glad when someone comes and they're concerned that there's something very serious going on, whether it's safety or otherwise, um, but not with the motivation of just trying to get somebody in trouble. But that's what the Chaldeans were doing here with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then we see uh, Nebuchadnezzar's blasphemy in verse 13. Nebuch then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. So he's, he's, he's furious. But then apparently, um, some, I, I forget where I read this, but it might have been a book about Daniel or it might have been another commentator, whoever it was. They made an interesting uh, observation that it's possible that he's furious initially, then he sees it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but then after their answer it says his visage was changed. So it appears that his, his demeanor toward them might have gotten a bit milder initially when he saw who it was, and then, but then based on their answer, which we'll see here in just a moment, uh, then he changed back to being very furious. We said in verse uh, 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast in the same cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now, let me tell you, when somebody gets to blasphemy, blaspheming, uh, that's when God has an extra incentive to step in and do something miraculous. Because God's name is at stake, his name is being blasphemed, his glory is being robbed from him. And, uh, he's, and that's, that's a strong statement. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Well, guess who's setting himself up as God? Nebuchadnezzar. Right? He, he thinks he's in the place of God at this point. And uh, by the way, that's the attitude of the, the spirit of Antichrist. That's an Antichrist attitude. And there have always been, you know, the devil's always had people on earth that fit that role of some way, shape, or form of Antichrist uh, where they have that same attitude, that, that spirit of Antichrist. Um, I'm just writing something down here because I forgot to put it in my notes, but I wanted to say it uh, later in the message. Um, if this pen works. Um, Anyway, just, that just came to my mind. But um, who is that God? Who is that God? That's a blasphemous statement to be insulting God like that. Oh, who is that God? Like basically putting God down. Like he's really not God. Who's, gonna, he's, who's, who's that God that's going to deliver you out of my hands? 
my hands. And that's the thing to recognize that in all of these false religions where they have multiple gods, these idols, really they're, they're idols, they're gods made with men's hands and so who really is God in those situations? It's man. It's man. Man is the God. Man is the God. It's, it's self-worship. It's, it's, it's delusional. It's, uh, it's a lie. It's, it sets man up as God. Now, unfortunately, there are some of the pagan religions of, of uh, ancient times where, I mean, they would, and in Bible times we see this, that they would make their children pass through the fire to appease these gods. But what kind of gods are they? I mean, they're, they're man-made gods, but what kind of wicked minds formulated these gods in their mind? It's just devilish. So we see Nebuchadnezzar's blasphemy and then the Hebrews' answer. Now, pride, I mentioned here too that pride was the source of Nebuchadnezzar's rage. And oftentimes, you know, when someone's just enraged and they're just angry and they have the spirit of anger, you're, you're generally talking about a prideful person. You're talking about a prideful person because how dare somebody offend me? How dare somebody do something that upsets me? And that's what Nebuchadnezzar's spirit was. He had the spirit of pride. If I'm grounded in the truth, if I'm grounded uh, in where I know I need to be and I'm yielded to God, I can be completely secure in my situation no matter what others are doing around me. I can be secure as a, as a parent because God put parents in, as the, the, in charge of the children, raising the children, um, I as a parent can be, be completely secure in my authority as a parent. I don't have to lash out, although of course as parents we probably all have gotten angry at times. We've all uh, responded in ways that would be fleshly. But I, in, in, my, in the ideal picture of how I would respond as a parent, want to respond as a parent is I want to respond completely secure in my authority that I have no need to be enraged. I have no need to be furious because I'm secure in who I am and who, where God has put me. And uh, what happens is when <laughs> children do something and, or say something and the parent gets angry, well, it's not really the parent who's in control anymore. They've given themselves over to anger, but their buttons were pushed by the children, so it's actually the children that are increasing in the control and influence. But as a parent, so, so how, do you get, how do you get a hold of this? How do you get a hold of a situation in your home? How do you get a hold of children in the situation and raising, disciplining, whatever is going on in children is I first need to be completely secure and confident in who I am as the parent and in the God-given authority. Uh, there are many parents who act helpless regarding their children. And, uh, I mean, you, you'll, you'll see, you know, eight, nine-year-old kids just running wild, and the parent just has no clue what to do with their eight- or nine-year-old child. And it's like, wait a minute, exercise some authority as the parent. But they don't, they, they probably read uh, too much of, um, you know, the humanistic ideas of uh, the right to the child and all these, you know, various things that, uh, or... Um, and that, and that may be why, um, you know, some subscribe to Hillary Clinton's philosophy. It takes a village. It takes a village to raise a child. No, it takes, it takes, it takes parents. It takes a mother and father. Amen. Father and mother to raise a child, raise children. Not a village. And, of course, uh, the church is vital in a family life, and a family's life, because the church is there to be a... A, uh, well, the, the church is there to benefit the home, and the home, a godly home, benefits the church. It's a reciprocal relationship, mutual benefit. But the church's job isn't to raise the children. The church's job is to support the parents in the raising of their children. Um, but pride is the source of rage. Pride is the source of Nebuchadnezzar's rage, and, and at the heart of an angry person... Uh, you'll, you'll, you trace it enough and uh, you'll find pride because how dare I be offended? How dare I get hurt? 
how dare somebody do something against me? And his pride was on display when he questioned God's ability to deliver them. Uh, verse 16, we see the Hebrews answer. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So their answer was one of a few words uh, that I see, not the words themselves, but the, the concepts here in, this, in these verses. First of all, they answered with certainty. They answered with certainty. They said, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, we don't have to take the time to figure out what we're going to say. Oh, we just got to say the right words. How are we going to put this? Um, no, they answered with certainty. They, they didn't take the time. They ha in other words, they had strong convictions ahead of time. And the only way you're going to stand in the time of adversity and challenge and, and when your faith is challenged and when God is being challenged, the God that you serve is being challenged or your, your, your convictions are challenged, is that you have those strong convictions ahead of time. You have already predetermined, this is who I worship, this is what, who I, whom I serve, this is what I believe, and uh, you don't have to take the time to figure out what to say. You already know where you stand on the matter. You already know, well, I don't serve those gods. I serve the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it should just be utmost certainty. Many people get carried away. Many professing Christians get carried away by the wicked world because they don't know what they believe or why they believe it. Actually, I wouldn't just say even Christians. Actually, I, I think I put people on purpose here. Many people just in general get carried away by the wicked world. Even, you know, there are lost people who they sense that things aren't necessarily right. When they see the twisted things going on in the world and the perversion, all these things, they, know, they, they see that things aren't quite right. But if they don't have, if they're not saved and they don't have biblical convictions, eventually, somewhere down the line, either they or their children or you know, going down the line are going to get swept up in the wicked world. But I think there are a lot of people who see a lot of things that they just don't, they, 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 they wouldn't agree or they don't see that they're right, but they don't actually have biblical godly convictions. Those, particularly those who aren't saved, wouldn't because they're not saved. But there are a lot of Christians who don't know what they believe or why they believe it. And that, that is uh, they, that, that a lot of people get carried away. I mean, ask the average Christian a question about doctrine. Well, what do you believe about this doctrine? Or what about this doctrine? Ask, and I would venture to say, I don't know if there's a lot of them that could answer. Now, some of that's the fault. A lot of that is the fault of the churches. It's the fault of the pastors for not teaching the people. But then there's also, there's a responsibility for those who sit in the pews to actually want to know what to believe, what they believe and why. But they, uh, they had the strong convictions ahead of time. They, um, they weren't going to get carried away by the wicked world, and they were not pragmatic. And they didn't make excuses about why it would be okay for them to bow. Now, could you picture a lot of people doing this today? I can picture people doing this. I can picture professing Christians. Yeah, it's something in violation of God's word or it's something that goes against God himself. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we can bend a little bit. God understands. We're kind of in this situation here. And just to get out of this situation and, you know, my heart really, I mean, I'm bowing out on the outside, but my heart is not bowing to this idol. I'm just, I'm just bending over to bow to this idol just to make it look impressive to them. But God knows my heart. God knows my heart. I can see a lot of the, that type of attitude today. God knows my heart, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't uh, operate that way. They just said, in verse 18, we will not serve thy gods. They said, we will not serve thy gods. Because bowing was the evidence of service and worship. We will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. They were not going to compromise their stand. They were not going to compromise their stand for God. Because here's what happens 
when you compromise the first time, it then kind of puts yourself in a position where you have to continue compromising or you try to backpedal and then you look like you're contradicting yourself. You're better off just standing firm the first time, come what may. Now in this case, in, in our case, you know, today, I don't think any of us have been faced with the fiery furnace. These guys are faced with fiery furnace, but they are standing firm the first time. Um, so not only did they answer with certainty, they answered with faith. They had faith in God's ability to deliver them. It's in verse 17, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. So they had utmost confidence in God's ability to deliver them from the fiery furnace. But notice in verse 18, they also answered with sacrifice, but if not, if he does not deliver us out of your hand, they were not doubting God's ability, they were simply being open to whatever God's will is for us in this particular time. They said, if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. They, they were not presumptuous on what God's decision would be. Mm. So, I mean, they're going into this. I mean, they, they could look really bad at the end of this thing. Like, Nebuchadnezzar would have the last laugh. He'd have the satisfaction. Well, see, I guess your God didn't deliver you. And, but they decided, they said, we believe in God's ability to deliver us. Deliver us. We have utmost confidence in him. But if not, if he does not do that, we're still not going to bow. We're still not going to bow. We're still not going to worship uh, this image. When standing for right, there is often or always a price to pay when you stand for right. Um, it's not pleasant in the moment, but there, there is a price to pay when you stand, on, you stand on what is right. Now, in this case, it would be the price of their lives. Uh, and in other cases, it may not be quite so dr drastic and dramatic, but uh, there is a price to pay. Yeah, and, and they went into this knowing that, that there was a price to pay. And we just need to have settled in our hearts knowing that when we stand for right, there's going to be at some point in time, there will be a price to pay. But we see God's miraculous deliverance in verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now this is why, I believe it was a commentator who wrote that he thinks that Nebuchadnezzar had softened his demeanor toward them because it says uh, back in, um, in verse 13 that he had rage and fury, but then it says, then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. So it, 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 he must have just calmed down a little bit. He's talking with them, but then when he realized they're not budging, I mean, he got really mad. The form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Now, I'm not sure what point he's trying to make here, but you know, when people are angry, they don't think rationally. <laughs> they don't make sense in their thinking. But I mean, the furnace is the furnace. They're going to die no matter what. And as a matter of fact, if you turn it down a little bit, they might suffer a little bit more. I mean, you, you get it that hot, I mean, they're not even going to suffer. <laughs> but it doesn't make sense. A person who's prideful and angry is not going to make sense in their thought processes. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and those. He wants, he wants to high up people. They end up dying because they <laughs> throw them into the furnace and they, they, they themselves were overcome by the heat. <coughs> um, so they were bound, bound in their coats, hose and hats, other garments. They're cast in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Verse, thir uh, verse 23, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And so uh, there's different ideas. Well, what does this mean here about like the Son of God? Suffice it to say that Nebuchadnezzar could see there was something supernatural about the fourth. 
there was something supernatural and something divine, something uh, at the very least angelic, uh, but the fourth is like the Son of God. So he realizes there is divine intervention here. And not only that, they had, they had fallen down in the midst. They fell down bound into the midst. But then when he looks, they are four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. When you stand for God, God will stand with you. Now, he might not show up in this way that he did to Nebuchadnezzar where Nebuchadnezzar could see. But when you stand for God, know that God will stand with you. Humanly speaking, very few people are willing to stand alone. It's a tough road, it's a tough road to go when you're standing alone. It's a, it's, it's a lonelier road to go when you're standing alone. And so many times people's natural instinct will be, boy, I want relationship, I want agreement, I want acceptance, I want all of these things. And so therefore they're just willing to put, put the convictions aside, put the beliefs aside and say, I'm... Uh, just, just let's let's just do away with that, just for the sake of peace with others and the sake of um, getting along with others in a greater way. And very few people are willing to take a stand, stand alone. But Acts chapter seven, verses fifty four, fifty through fifty six, with Stephen, when he had just the amazing message, the amazing speech. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And I'm sure many a message has been preached about, you know, Jesus Christ standing for Stephen or gave him a standing ovation or whatever, however people have put that. Uh, the point is Jesus wasn't sitting on the right hand of God at that point. He was standing on the right hand of God and Stephen saw that. And God, no doubt, was standing with, standing for, standing with Stephen even as he lost his life because he was willing. He did stand alone at that point and he lost his life. So then, uh, after all of this takes place, um, you know, not a hair of their head was singed, not, not their coats, uh, nothing happened to their clothes, no smell of the fire. And so then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 28, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. So now he's turning around. Oh, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and boy, Nebuchadnezzar, make up your mind here. I mean, we've seen a lot of changed minds so far, and we're going to, I mean, and so he goes to the opposite extreme. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language that speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill. <laughs> you go from fiery furnace to... Speak against his God. Now, wait a minute, Nebuchadnezzar, you just spoke against their God. No? You changed your mind real quick there, didn't you? But this vacillation between extremes is indicative of a person who lives by feelings instead of truth. Just vacillating, not stable, not steady, just going by his feelings, going by the moment, living in the moment, what he's seeing, and not being stable, not living in the truth. So the original question at the beginning of the message was, will you stand when others bow? Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stood when others were bowing. Will you stand when others bow to false doctrine? Will you stand when others bow to false doctrine? There are many false doctrines out there. And, uh, and, and you know, and what's, I guess the most grievous to me is there's a lot of decent, good people who get caught up in false doctrine. A lot of well-meaning people get caught up in false doctrine. You know, there are people who believe you might be able to lose your salvation. Or there's people that believe when you're, you know, some people are actually predestined to hell and some are chosen to go to heaven, but those predestined to hell don't have a choice in the matter. It's just all, that's for the glory of God and His judgment, His justice. But the Bible says that God's will is that all come to repentance, and so he's long-suffering, giving people an opportunity uh, to come to Lord Jesus Christ if they would only repent and turn to Jesus Christ. There are people who believe you know, your baptism saves you. 
or your good works save you. There's all kinds of false doctrines that, uh, that others are bowing to, that others are being carried away with. Then there are others uh, who are bowing to materialism and worldly entertainment. There's the prosperity gospel. There's just the obsession with entertainment, even in the Christian world. Uh, and I mentioned this this morning in Sunday school, and I said I was going to maybe speak a little more about it tonight in the message. And it was in this context of the worldly entertainment. There's a new movie. I just found out about it yesterday. And uh, the reason I found out about it, I saw an article about it of someone said they weren't going to watch it for some key reasons. But um, so anyway, it's a new movie distributed by Universal Pictures. Uh, it is um, apparently my... Notes didn't get updated at some point because I thought I updated those. But anyway, um, that's what happens when you have things on the cloud. It doesn't always carry over properly. Um, I think I know what happened. I printed it too soon. I didn't let that computer up to date. But anyway, I, I, it'll be fine. Uh, is, uh, it's, it's distributed by Universal Pictures, but it's, it's um, produced by the company that used to be called Pure Flix, but they changed their name to Pinnacle Peak Pictures or something like that. And uh, so then they've done other movies, Christian movies. Um, and this is based on the book, a book that was written, I guess, 20, 30 years ago by Francine Rivers called Redeeming Love. And it's based on Hosea, supposedly, <laughs> inspired by the book of Hosea. But it's really more of a romance. And I, and I don't know anything about Francine Rivers. This is one of those romance novel things and, and called Redeeming Love. And it's, it has to do with a a young girl uh, who, uh, as a, at a young age, was sold into prostitution, and then as she grows up, there's this guy who, who's, whose last name is Hosea, so you know it's based on the Bible. Um, that's, that's, the key, that's the key there. He represents Hosea. But he just believes, this is God's woman for me. This is his will for my life. And so he meets her and, and the whole story. But the, the movie contains partial nudity and depictions of acts of a married couple and other intense and disturbing themes. Actually, there's a lot of really some hardcore themes depicted throughout the movie here, various, various things, in addition to violence and, and things. So much of the discussion was based on whether it's appropriate for a Christian to watch because of the subject matter. Uh, and that's a, that's a valid conversation from what I heard about it, read about it. But the root of the issue to begin with is that the whole premise to the story is unbiblical. It's, it's not a picture of Hosea in the Bible. The only remote similarity is that God redeems people out of their sin and their bad situation. Okay, that's, that's a very basic biblical truth. You don't need a movie like that to show. Um, but the other thing is there's an attitude, a growing attitude among Christians that they must have Christian entertainment. We must have more Christian movies. We must have, and not these, and, and, and especially when there's one that has greater production quality to it, then people really get excited because here's actually a Christian movie that looks more like the world's movies in its production quality. <laughs> wow, because there's, and I will say, and there's rightfully so the, the jokes and the, uh, the mocking of previous Christian movies are just absolutely lousy in their production quality and um, bad acting and all, just all sorts of things. And so, wow, we're finally getting some programming that we can be entertained by. Wait a minute, Christians, we, when it comes to biblical themes, biblical, particularly biblical story, we... we it, the, 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 con, the overall obsession and the over, I'd say, the excessive desire to be entertained is concerning because, wait a minute, this, this book, how many of those people have even read the book of Hosea and even know what it's about? And so I decided, I, it's been a little while since I read the book of Hosea, so I'm going to just skim down through it, read a little bit, make sure I'm kind of on track here, realizing this is not a biblical movie. Well, you just read the first three verses of Hosea and you, you can, I mean, pretty much blows that whole premise out of the water because... The book of Hosea, the theme of the book of Hosea is God's people Israel and Judah, but God's people Israel, he is, he tells Hosea, go take a wife of whoredoms. Go take a whore as your wife. And 
be, to represent God, who is the and, and Israel, Israel, the bride of God the Father, uh, them them being unfaithful to Him. And so it was people who already belonged to God; they were His people, but they are then going and whoring themselves with idols and all kinds of wickedness. So. I just want to say to people, be careful about what you're comparing to here. You know, do you really want to compare yourself to, uh, oh, isn't God's redeeming love wonderful and all this with the book of Hosea? Well, wait a minute. This was pretty serious stuff in the book of Hosea. And the other thing I would mention is a lot of the, the storyline that has some of the more disturbing content in it uh, doesn't even, isn't even uh, existent in the book of Hosea. It's not even part of, of that account. So there's so much added to that story. It's just simply a love story, a romance story. Hosea is not a love story. There's a little bit where it says that God was, would show mercy to Judah. So there's a little bit there about God's um, mercies there. Most of it is simply him being very unhappy with Israel and Judah. And maybe, so maybe a movie like that and the response to it is very appropriate that God's not very happy with uh, many of the Christians who are just obsessed with the world and the world's entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I realize this is put together supposedly by Christians, but, um, but worldly actors, secular actors. So even Michael Hosea, who's the guy's name, Michael Hosea, and his, he ends up taking this woman as his wife. She gets abused. And then she gets beaten up or whatever. And then he takes her to, he buys her, takes her to his house. And then she's going to run away and all this. And um, so that is, um, there's, the, there's the obsession with, with entertainment, materialism. Um, and there are people who actually believe that the more faith-based entertainment coming out of Hollywood, and I realize this wasn't done by an actual Hollywood movie studio, although it's distributed by uh, one of the huge media companies, because Pure Flix back in 2016 had struck an agreement with Universal Pictures to distribute their movies. But they think, oh boy, things are getting better in our culture when we have faith-based movies. Boy, our culture, we're we're finally making some progress in the culture war. And I look, at, I look around and I say, I don't see any progress being made. I see more of a biblically ignorant people than ever. <laughs> when we see people start getting back to their Bibles and getting immersed in sound doctrine, then I'll say, all right, we're making some progress here. But when people are running out the movie theater watching that stuff, I don't see that. It's no doubt would pull on the emotions. It would be very disturbing. Um, anyway, that... Uh, Another thing about materialism and worldly entertainment is one thing leads to another. And just recently, in the last couple of weeks, I saw two occasions of churches that were playing, that played a song by a wicked, satanic rock band. One of them was Faith Church. Now, and apparently the pastor, the new pastor there, who's, by the way, named Brett. I'm not the only Pastor Brett in town anymore. Uh, <laughs> Um, so call me Pastor Reitenbach from now. I'm just uh, <laughs> now you can call me Pastor. Um, anyway, he requested that their band play the song by the Who. And I'm not even sure what the whole point of it was. I, I don't know what he was getting at with all this. But they're playing. They're, they're up there rocking out to the Who. <laughs> and so a little while later, just this past week, I saw um, Andy Stanley, um, who has his just mountains of problems. He's, one of the, he's a pastor of a large, very influential pastor. He pastors in Georgia and thousands and thousands of people and people follow him and all this kind of thing. And he's one of these leadership motivational gurus of the day and, and leading the way toward racial justice, social justice, saying that pretty much if you're a white man, you're pretty much racist. I mean, um, so <clears throat> he then, their church... <laughs> They started out, I think they started a service this way. Their band was playing, um, oh, now, I'm, well, now it's flipped. See, I didn't have my notes. Their band, it's, it might come to me. Um, their band was playing one of the, one of the, wicked, uh, one of the wicked rock 
rockers of, uh, of back in the day, the satanic rockers. Um, I cannot think of it. I cannot think of it. Uh, it'll come to me. Let me just move on, and I might come back to this. But the, the uh, will you stand when others bow to the gay and transgender agenda? And, you know, there's, there's a, an amazingly ominous, terrible law that was passed in Canada. Uh, they have a new conversion therapy ban. And I, a, a new conversion therapy ban. And the... Um, I realize that some of the practices of conversion therapy, even as a Christian, would be I, I wouldn't be for because I'm just for the truth of God's word. Um, you, you present the truth to people, and there needs to be a change of mind, a change of heart, and just sifting through whatever they're dealing with. It's it's not going to be some physical thing to do, some psychological uh, mumbo jumbo hocus pocus you can do, and so. I understand, and a lot of states have uh, bans on conversion therapy, so I understand the thinking as far as being opposed to those types of things, but what else, the concern is what else gets swept up in this? That if you were to even just simply sit down and talk with someone about their sexual orientation or their gender identity, gender expression, that if you were to discourage them from that, would that be caught up in the anti conversion therapy laws and here's what it actually says in the law this is in the preamble whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society now here's the thing this is this is why this law is such a, a, a chilling law in Canada whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society because among other things it is based on and propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation gender identity and gender expression including the myth that heterosexuality, cisgender gender identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over other sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions. So what they're saying is, this is that is harmful to society because it, it indicates, is that it comes along with the idea that, that if you only believe that there's man and woman, and you, you are that way and you stay that way, or that a man should be married to a, a woman and a, you know, a woman should marry a man and that's where you have the relations um, that if you believe those things should be preferred that's a harm to society that those are actually better so then um, here's how they define conversion therapy it means a practice treatment or service designed to change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual change a person's gender identity to cisgender, change a person's gender expression so that conforms to the sex assigned to the person at birth, repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior, repress a person's non-cisgender gender identity, or repress or reduce a person's gender expression that does not conform to the sex assigned to the person at birth. So anything you do to try to discourage that and repress that and not support that is conversion therapy. For greater certainty, here's what it says, for greater certainty, this definition does not include a practice, treatment, or service that relates to the exploration or development of an integrated personal identity, such as a practice, treatment, or service that relates to a person's gender transition, and that is not based on an assumption that a particular sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression is to be preferred, to be preferred over another. So as long as you're, if you're helping a person transition, that's okay. As long as you don't look at one as better than the other, or uh, anything that's not based on an assumption that one sexual orientation, gender identity is to be preferred over another. Now that pretty much covers any anybody who'd be Christian, believe the Bible, and you're trying to help someone. So, so how far does that go? Well, we'll I mean, time will tell how far that goes. But the other thing is. They are also they also outlawed the advertisement of conversion therapy, where even just advertising it could get people two years in jail. Actually, breaking this particular law of participating in it could get people five years in jail. But they put the advertisement for conversion therapy on the same category in the same laws as child pornography the possession of child pornography on a computer. So if you have an advertisement for conversion therapy on your computer, that that could be treated the same as child pornography. That's, that's in the wording of the law. And, and some other thing, not just that, but uh, wording of the law. So 
Will you stand? I mean, who's? I mean, they're going to face a challenge. Um, Brother uh, Philion in Canada, um, with uh, the church there in Quadacook, uh, they were facing a challenge because Quebec has some of the strictest COVID restrictions in the world at this point. And it was going to be so bad that they were going to have to decide whether or not they were going to follow um, having to, for people to prove vaccination status to come to church. And, uh, and they had made their decision of how they were going to handle that. But in the process of that happening, before that could even go into effect, the, Quebec, the premier of Quebec just said, all right, nope, no, no gatherings whatsoever. We're just doing it with gatherings whatsoever. And so that's been a challenge for churches over the last two years of will, who's going to stand, who, how, what, what, what are you willing to stand on, what hill are you willing to die on, what, are you, uh, what do you not want to sacrifice short term for long term, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of um, decisions uh, to be made in that. And my primary way of thinking is... is um, the first and foremost hill I'm willing to die on if it's something that's clearly defined and spelled out in Scripture is a non-negotiable. Then there are other things when you have a public health situation, whether or not it's, it's justified uh, with all of the measures that are being taken, then you decide what am I willing to stand on and what am I willing to go along with. And that's, that's been you know, a very difficult um, decision-making process for a lot of churches, a lot of pastors, in a lot of places. And, um, and I'm just going to try to find um, I'm going to try to find who that band was. Um, I don't know if I can find it. But uh, anyway, I it just slipped my mind. I didn't have it in my notes here. Um, but Andy Stanley uh, had his band, I mean, just vile, vile, just rock song. As far as I say vile, just the appearance of it, the flashing lights, it was almost blinding and just just absolutely incredible. And I, I don't remember the, the hard uh, rock band that it was. But there, so you have the entertainment, you have the gay and transgender agenda, and that's, that's not going away. It's not going away. It's going to get more and more. Uh, because it's being supported. Oh, it's so wonderful. It's so and and just the the height of perverseness uh, in relation to what's happening to what's being taught and done to children and um, just absolutely uh, it's it's idolatrous. It's it's anti-biblical. It's anti-Christ. And will you stand when others bow? What are you willing to stand on? And you know where I'm willing to stand on that issue is I can show respect from a day-to-day day-to-day -day level, I can show respect to anybody. I can respect someone as a human being, but don't expect me to throw my support and to validate uh, and, and, and be supportive of their lifestyle choices that are outside of the realms of the scripture, no matter what uh, comes that way. And then another enemy of, um, or another uh, Another situation, will you stand when others bow? Many are bowing to ecumenism. Ecumenism. And um, I'm finding, and just recently this was just, every, every once in a while this gets drilled into me deeper and deeper. The biggest price that we have paid, that I have paid in this church on the issue of, well, of, of what people decide to do <laughs> is the doctrines of the church, the Lord's Supper, and membership. That's been the, that's been the toughest one. No, put put in, in Bible versions to put that in there. But, but really, the doctrine of the church and, uh, and then people who have issues with they would come and not be members, and then I say, well, we're going to have the Lord's Supper, but it's, it's a church ordinance. We believe it's for members. So you need to be members of the church to partake because it's a church ordinance. It's when ye come together, talking about the members of the church. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a believer's ordinance. It's a church ordinance. And so people get upset about that. Well, wait a minute. Are, are you not 
part of a church where you can partake of the Lord's Supper? I mean, why are you upset with me about that? I mean, you're not, you chose not to be a member here, so why are you upset with me? If you're not uniting with this church, why should I be expected to serve you the Lord's Supper? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Well, we're not going to become members. We have this difference. We have this difference. But we're upset with you because we can't partake of communion. Well, then go find a church where you can partake of the Lord's Supper. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying I, I don't get the thinking. But I will say that is the biggest price. Over the years we've been here, that's the, some of the biggest price I've had to pay with having to take a stand on certain doctrines. And then people say, well, you know, I guess we'll just uh, we'll go, do, we'll go somewhere else. I said, what's what's controversial about saying the church is a local assembly, you get saved, you get baptized, you get added to the church, you become a member, you become committed to the church and its doctrine, and then you get the privileges of church membership, one of which is the Lord's Supper. What's so controversial about that? You know, when I say it like that, it doesn't sound so bad, does it? It doesn't sound controversial. But it is. Why? Because of errant doctrine on what the church is. That, uh, you know, the... Anyway, so, but that leads to the, the, the doctrines of the universal church, an invisible church uh, leads to great ecumenism. Yeah, you know, that's just people bounce from here and there, and, and, uh, and they, they, they start this ministry, that ministry, and they do this and they do that. And, um, and it's, you know, it's, I, I find, what I find, what I, when you really trace it back, if people get their doctrine on the church straight, then... They'll, they'll get some other, the other things will, will line up. But that's the biggest price that I've had to pay. Um, someone just texted me yesterday and he said, yeah, well, you know, my, we want to be, you know, we really want to be actively involved in members somewhere else. And there's, there's some other doctrinal differences. So I, but it wasn't the things that I thought would be mentioned. It was, yeah, we have some differences on communion and, you know, membership. And I'm thinking, why is this always the one that comes up? I know we had other differences. But that, that was what was actually mentioned. I think, okay, well, that's, that's fine. I mean, but, uh, I mean, I could, I could give you multiple a- examples. And it's, it's, let me tell you, it's a tough thing. It doesn't make me very happy. <laughs> For two reasons. One is, it's like, I want to see the church grow. But I'm not going to see the church grow by pragmatism. Like, well, if this is what people want, then I need to be willing. Let me just tell you, if there are not certain distinctives in our church, and we just say, well, let's just blend with what all the other churches are doing, I have no purpose for being here to begin with. I have no purpose being here to begin with. I'll, I'll go down the road. I'll go somewhere else. There's plenty of other places. If you didn't know, America's a big place. The world's a big place. It's like, well, if I'm not willing, it's like, that's what I come back to, say, look, if I'm not willing to stand for certain doctrines that I believe to be true, the scriptural things about what the church is, what church membership is, and the Lord's Supper, all those things tie together. And if I'm not willing to stand on that, I, I just, um, if I'm not willing to stand on um, not having contemporary worship here, then... There, there are plenty of other choices people have. Plenty of other choices people have. You say, boy, the, the church would grow a lot faster if you just do this, this, and that. I'm not going to give into pragmatism. Now, if the Lord shows me areas of adjustment, things that need to be different, and that things that might be inadvertently hindering growth, certainly I'm all ears to the Lord's leading on that. But that's, that's been the biggest price to pay, and that's why I said late, uh, earlier, when, when standing for right, there's, there is always a price to pay. I didn't really expect that to be the price to pay, but it, it is. Um, didn't realize that would be the thing to have to stand on. And, you know, a number of years ago, several years ago, we had, you know, a family would come, and they'd, they'd be coming, and, and finally one person said, yeah, my, and these were adult sons or older sons. Uh, I don't know if they were adult, adult yet at that point, but at least young adult sons. Yeah, they haven't been baptized. And I said, all right, well, when someone... Um, Gets, you know, someone gets baptized and become a member of the church. You know, we can talk about all that and give you a copy of our statement of faith, our constitution. And it was after that the, the attendance trickled off and there was, let's just say, a laundry list of grievances after that in talking to this person. Not the core issue, but I knew 
that was the core issue. That was what set the things in motion. But then this is the grievance, this is the grievance, this is the grievance, this is the grievance, which wasn't really the root of the issue. And uh, so, oh, when I say it doesn't make me very happy, one is, of course, I want to see the church grow, but the other thing is I want to see people grow. I want to see people be grounded and settled in a church in sound doctrine. And so I hate it for the people who vacillate, they bounce around, they, they aren't sure, quite sure, uh, uh, they, they, they're, they're not content. Now many times those people are usually the ones uh, that are, if it's not that, it's going to be something else. But will you stand when others bow? Will you stand when others bow? Um, so I, w- I wanted to be a little transparent there because that's just the reality of the situation. It's the reality of the situation that, of all things, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the other thing that's caused an issue is people say, yeah, well, we don't believe using the King James Bible, and I'll even show them, I mean, I'll show them, say, well, you know, this, two things that are different are not the same. Here's what this says here, and then here's what, here's what this says. I mean, you can't both be God's word. <laughs> That, I mean, that, once again, I'm not, and I'm not trying to be mean or personal. It's not a personal issue. I don't, I don't hold personal grudges against people. So, so let me just be very clear about that. I don't hold personal grudges against people. I may get grieved. I may get grieved. I don't hold personal grudges. But I'm just being honest. That is what happens. That is the reality of the situation. And um, anyway. I digress. But will you stand when others bow? There's the false doctrines, there's materialism and worldly entertainment. Um, And and these are just a few. I mean, you could add a lot more to the list. You could add a lot more to the list. Um, But those are some of the big big ones. And who knows what else? Who knows what else is going to come down the line? There's a lot of things that come down the line. But we must stay faithful. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't have they didn't have to think about what they were going to say. They knew where they stood. They knew where they uh, they knew, they just knew. And so we need to be a people of God who know what we believe, why we believe it. And you know, if you're um, and by the way, you know, people become want to become members of the church. We don't expect you to complete an exam before becoming a member. Like, oh yeah, you better dot all your I's and cross all your T's. All it takes is someone who's got a teachable spirit and says, look, I don't hold any contrary doctrine to what this church believes, but I'm a, I'm, I have a teachable spirit and I'm willing to identify with church, this church and what it believes, and so I'm willing to go forward and unite with this church and membership and learn and grow and be grounded as a, as a member of the church. So it's not a matter of having to have everything together, your whole life together, your whole doctrine together. That's not the issue at all. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were firmly grounded and settled in what they believe. And uh, they were willing to take a stand even at the cost of their life. And there may be a time at some point in your life that you may be expected to take a stand and it might cost you jail. It might be a jail. It might be a fine. It might be your life. It might be something. But will you stand? Will you stand when others bow?